Hello, welcome to Humanities 130, Society and Finance. We're going to be talking about poverty and the world today. <clears throat> so before we get into the actual discussion of poverty, let's look at the facts about the world. As of 2016, the world population is hovering at about 7.4 billion people um, and the largest populations by country China 1.4 billion India 1.3 billion and then we drop down a billion to the United States which is at around 324 million Indonesia 258 million Brazil 205 million Pakistan 190 million Nigeria 188 million so you'll see that within the first two largest populations China and India you're looking at almost a third of the entire population of the world um, in these two countries and um, ironically or not ironically um, as one might expect you see a huge concentration of poverty in these two countries um, so when we are talking about poverty oftentimes we'll be discussing the East and Southeast Asia and that will often refer to those two areas so let's talk about poverty approximately 3 billion people live on less than two dollars and fifty cents per day and that is how we define poverty across the globe there are approximately two billion children in the world and one billion of them are living in poverty so what we see here is that half the children on earth live on two dollars and fifty cents a day according to UNICEF twenty two thousand children die each day due to poverty so when we think of the leading causes of death you know we often think of cancer or HIV AIDS or child abuse but really what we need to focus on as a leading cause of death for children is poverty the link between poverty and education is really glaring one billion people entered the 21st century unable to read or write and 67 percent of those were women so what you see here is that you have this huge number of people living in poverty and many of them a third of them cannot read or write so education is really a way of getting out of poverty or at least pulling yourself out of the most dire straits of poverty less than one percent of what the world spent every year on defense budgets was needed to put every child into school by the year 2000 and this goal was not met this was discussed during the 1990s and you know people really felt that this was an opportunity to improve the world and make it a better place but unless you have world leaders willing to commit part of their budget to these goals it's not going to happen children from the wealthiest 20 percent of the population are four times more likely to be in school than the 20th are the poorest 20 percent and I mean that just makes sense um, if you get into the top 1 percent of the population obviously you're going to have you know a much higher percentage according to UNESCO 61 million primary school age children were not enrolled in school in 2010 that's a huge number of children who should be in school but are not in school and of these children 47 percent were never expected to enter school and I guess you don't have to be you know a scientist or a researcher to presume that the vast majority of those were girls because in a lot of countries especially developing countries the thought process is that girls do not need an education whereas the boys might in fact need their education 
26% attended school but left, and 27% are expected to attend school sometime in the future. There is a young woman who has uh, been in the news in the last few years. She was shot in the head by the Taliban because she wanted to attend school, Malala. She won the Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, and her entire um, motivation, her activities, her actions have all been geared towards the idea of giving women and girls the opportunity to be educated. And, you know, that's the thing is people are afraid of education um, because they know it'll take powerless people and give them power. Speaking of power, it is not with the people. 1.6 billion people live without electricity. And the vast majority of these people live in Southeast Asia, including India, Sub-Saharan Africa, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes, and East Asia, and again, that's where you would see China. 2.4 billion people rely on traditional biomass fuels for cooking and heating. And biomass are things like wood, leaves, and animal waste. Um, cow manure is especially a valuable biomass because what do cows eat? Hay. And, um, you know, cows' waste tends to be very flammable, so they dry it out and use it to uh, keep the fires lit. So for those of us who live in a developed country and are used to turning on our stove, we might be horrified, and yet this is a very normal way of living for a lot of people in this world. Water is a very scarce resource, and it is getting more and more challenging. In this country, in the United States, California has been dealing with a water crisis for almost a decade, and severe water rationing has been put into effect by their governor and it has helped but it's still very very scarce 1.1 billion people in developing countries have inadequate access to water meaning they have to walk miles just to access their water and 2.6 billion people lack basic sanitation <clears throat> excuse me basic sanitation things like flush toilets having sewers, having running water that you can wash your hands. You know, what we have in developed countries that we take for granted is miraculous in some of these locations. Close to half of all people in developing countries suffering at any given time from a health problem caused by water and sanitation deficits. One of the biggest problems that you will see is diarrhea. You know, children who are just dehydrated constantly because they have a perpetual case of diarrhea that cannot be treated successfully because of all the waterborne bacteria that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And these kids, again, oftentimes die from something so simple as diarrhea, something that, and again, in a first world country, we go to our CVS or Rite Aid, get some meds, and we're home and fine in a couple days. So again, what we have to think about here is poverty is not being lazy. It's not being unwilling to learn. It's not having access, and that's the key. These folks do not have access to the resources they need to pull themselves out of poverty. Two billion people on average use about 20 liters of water per day. In the United Kingdom, the average person uses about 150 liters of water per day. And in the United States, the average person uses 600 liters of water per day. 
So you can see by the averages here that in a country like the United States, we take for granted that we can turn on a spigot and water will just gush out. How many of us leave the water running when we brush our teeth? How many of us take 20 minute showers? How many of us shower once, twice a day? Every day. You know, this is something that is completely unknown in other countries because it's not a social norm because they don't have access to water the way we do. So let's talk about hunger. 800 million people are undernourished around the world. That's almost a billion. So almost one in seven are hungry in this world. It is worst in Asia, 526 million people, half a billion people, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America in the Car Caribbean. You know, when we think of the Caribbean, we think of going to a resort and drinking fruity drinks and laying in the sun. But the reality is in countries like Haiti, the poverty is unbelievable. The corruption amongst its leaders is unbelievable. And as a consequence, what you see is a vast number of citizens without access to any way of getting regular food. You know, they are living day to day trying to access enough food to feed their family. 60% of the world's hungry are women. Why? Well, what do women do when their children are hungry? They give up their own food and give it to their children. Three million children under the age of five die each year from malnutrition. And again, you know, if this was a situation where you saw a number of children dying in the United States or Germany or England or um, China from particular illness like chicken pox, people would be freaking out. But poverty is such a horrible disease and yet we can't really combat it because people refuse to accept it that it's disease that can be fixed. You know, they see it as a social condition uh, that people have put themselves in. Then we get into HIV and AIDS. 37 million people on Earth have HIV or AIDS. 70% of those people live in sub-Saharan Africa. So over here on the right hand side I have a map of Africa and you'll see the Saharan Desert cutting across the top of Africa. What you'll see here is north of the Saharan um, Desert are countries like Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco. These are countries that are often more connected to what we usually think of as the Middle East and then you have the Saharan Desert and then you have Sub-Saharan and these are the countries right below that Sudan, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, um, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Sudan, Rwanda, Congo. Um, these are the countries where you see a terrible outbreak of HIV AIDS. And part of it was because there was a lot of cultural norms that had to be overcome because people didn't accept that um, it was not just a gay disease because originally when HIV and AIDS first came out it was originally thought to be just gay men and drug addicts and if you weren't a gay man or a drug addict it couldn't possibly happen to you and unfortunately it happened to a lot of people 15 million children were orphaned due to HIV and AIDS which created a bigger issue also because who was left to take after these children look after these kids 
and when you don't have anyone looking after these kids what you end up with is a bunch of young people who were not given the opportunity to grow up in a traditional sense instead they were put in a situation where they had to either raise themselves raise their younger siblings or many of them were recruited to be child soldiers fifty percent of people with HIV or AIDS are women which again goes against the idea that all people with HIV and AIDS are gay men eighty percent of all young women living with HIV live in sub-saharan Africa which correlates to the fact that eighty percent of young women in sub-saharan Africa have not completed secondary education and a third cannot read or write so again what you see here is a lack of education results in people not understanding and not knowing and not having access to information which allows them to be put in a scenario where they don't know how to protect themselves so in many countries it is common for girls as young as 15 to marry a much older man legally but she cannot access contraceptives until she is 19 which just oftentimes makes many of us shake our heads but if you look at some of the laws in the United States they too don't always make sense it is also a cultural norm in many of these countries for men to engage in relationships outside of his marriage you know prior to this era you know there was a lot of cultural superstitions for example um, there was a belief that if a man with HIV or AIDS slept with a virgin he would be cured well unfortunately what that did was when he slept with a virgin she would oftentimes bleed when her hymen was broken which then transferred the HIV virus directly into her putting her on the path to HIV uh, another outside of the realm of medical science idea was that condoms were introduced by white people to stem black people from or Africans from reproducing and to kill the black race and you know this is not correct it was an attempt to stem STDs and pregnancies voluntarily um, you know you can go back in history 3,000 years and they were using the intestines of sheep to create contraceptives and you know pre um, modern day eras another cultural norm that was uh, no longer <clears throat> seen um, these days as uh, accurate was the idea that circumcision was inappropriate you know in the United States most young men when they're born are circumcised and this is something that's relatively new and recently in the last 20 years a lot of Africans have moved in the direction of getting circumcised now why is this a big deal well the foreskin of a circumcised male when it's cut off it basically doesn't collect anything underneath but if a foreskin is still there it keeps the HIV virus tucked in and it doesn't hit oxygen the HIV virus as soon as it hits oxygen it dies so when the HIV um, virus doesn't have a chance to hide under the so-called turtleneck of the foreskin it's less likely to transmit to someone else so let's look at how poverty ex, um, affects lifespan so these are the countries with the highest life expectancies we have Japan Switzerland France Norway Sweden and you're gonna live to be 84 83 82 so we're looking at some really good numbers here and of course you know what do all these countries have in common they tend to be pretty wealthy and they all have universal health care meaning that if you 
break your leg, if you have a cough, if something doesn't feel right, you can go to the doctors and not have to worry about having extremely high bills. On the other hand, the countries with the lowest life expectancies, Swaziland, Sierra Leone, Chad, Nigeria, and Somalia, and again your life expectancies ranging from 49 to 55, which is considerably lower than the highest, you know, again, what do these countries have in common? Unfortunately, they're all in sub-Saharan Africa, and a lot of these will be related to poverty and HIV AIDS and all of the bloodborne or all of the waterborne illnesses that come along with that. So how do we fix this? Education. In developing low-income countries, every additional year of education can increase a person's future income by an average of 10%. Women with a primary school, and that's elementary school education, are 13% more likely to know that condoms can reduce their risk of contracting HIV and AIDS. That's huge. That's a huge improvement. So then there's this other thing called microcredit. Microcredit is giving very small loans, i.e. microloans, to the unemployed, to poor entrepreneurs, and to others living in poverty who are not considered good credit risks. It was a concept developed by a college professor named Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh in the 1970s as an economic experiment. And he went on to win the Nobel Prize, little typo there, for peace. And you're saying, wait, wasn't this an economics experiment? Yes, but it was so successful that it improved conditions and it actually resulted in a resolution that allowed for more peaceful experiences for people. So Eunice decided to focus on women since they were more likely to stay in one location because they are the primary caregivers to their children. He gave 42 women $27 each. Now remember, this is the 1970s, so I guess, you know, in today's money, you're looking at about 150 bucks each, to start a small company. All of the women had to attend the solidarity group meetings, almost like support group, where they learned the basics of running a business and networked with one another. All of the women started successful businesses and repaid their loans. So clearly the experiment was a big success. Eunice then started Grameen Bank, which has lo loaned out over $5 billion to millions of borrowers. Close to 96% of Grameen loans have gone to women, who are more likely than men to repay loans and to devote their earnings to serving the needs of their family. And again, it's not necessarily, you know, women are better than men. It's just women have been socialized to believe they are responsible for their children much more than men have. Now, that has also changed because women have been socializing their sons to take more responsibility. And as such, you see a newer generation of men who are more committed to sticking around and being part of their family. The World Bank estimates that there are now more than 7,000 microfinance institutions serving some 16 million poor people in developing countries. So what can someone like you do? You can even do your part. You can go to a website, kiva.org, and you can put in 25 bucks towards somebody's small business and you can help get them out of poverty. Everything from helping someone buy a piece of equipment so they can better farm their one or two acres of land or you can help them buy seeds or use um, more effective tools. Any number of things are there. So I urge you all to go look and check out this site even if you don't have 
any money to donate right now. So, if you have any questions, please, as always, feel free to text or email me, and I hope you have a fabulous day. Thank you.